Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Carrie Racian, and I'm an Associate Professor of Public Policy and the Director of UConn's ARM Center. On behalf of ARMS and INCHIP, I would like to welcome you to today's lecture with Dr. Ali Rohani. And I would also like to extend a special thanks to Melanie Skolnick and Josh Harden at INCHIP for the behind the scenes work in making this lecture possible. Dr. Rohani is the Bartley Dobb Professor for the Study and Prevention of Violence, Professor of Epidemiology, Adjunct Professor of Pediatrics, and Adjunct Professor of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Washington. He evaluates social programs and public policies for their impact on multiple forms of violence with a particular emphasis on preventing firearm-related harm. His talk today is entitled Extreme Risk Protection Orders to Prevent Firearm-Related Harm. And his talk on ERPO laws is both timely and important. You may know that Connecticut is considered to be the first state to have enacted ERPO or red flag laws, which we did in 1999 after the Connecticut lottery shooting. Since that time, about half of the states in the US have some version of an ERPO law. And importantly, Connecticut recently adopted provisions to strengthen our ERPO laws, and those went into effect this past summer. Nationally, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act allocates $750 million in funding for states to implement and improve their ERPO laws. And of course, as conversations about mental health and firearm-related harm progress, understanding ERPO laws becomes critically important. And so thank you so much, Dr. Rohani Rabar, for speaking to us today. We're all very eager to engage with you. So that our participants know, Dr. Rahani will present today for about 45 minutes. We will hold questions and comments until the end. And after his presentation, he will take questions and comments from the audience. Also, thank you to each of you for joining us today. And it's now my pleasure to turn it over to our speaker. Great, thank you very much, Gary, for that introduction. Um, please let me know if you have any difficulty in audio or uh, video, let me just share my screen. Um, let me know if you can see these slides. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you all. Um, I'm not there, obviously, in person, um, but I have to say that Connecticut has a very special place in, in, my, in my mind, in my heart. Um, 19 years ago, um, I immigrated to the United States and um, after landing in um, at JFK, I went directly to Bridgeport, Connecticut, stayed there for a couple of nights, and then went to New Haven for my MPH at Yale. And so Connecticut was the first state in the United States that I lived in. And I have many, many fond memories of Connecticut, different cities and my experience. So thank you very much for, for having me here. Um, I, I thought, it would be really critical to start our talk with Sandy Hook. Um, this takes us back, obviously, 10 years ago, the 10 years, uh, 10th anniversary is coming up. Um, when Sandy Hook happened, as I'm sure many of you are aware um, and felt it very closely, many people's lives changed for forever. And uh, my own life was, was one of them. Many grassroots organizations, as you know, were born. Um, and some people who really were not active in this area in terms of gun violence prevention began contributing to this effort. I was a vaccine preventable disease epidemiologist. I worked on vaccine research. I worked on vaccine adverse events. That was my training. Um, in my PhD in epidemiology and then my postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford and CDC. I had just joined University of Washington as an assistant professor in epidemiology, started teaching epi methods in, in late September of that year, 2012. Um, and um, it's a quarter based system at University of Washington. So we start late in September. Um, and um, I had just began, begun um, thinking about how to form a research group to continue my work on vaccine adverse events and vaccine related injuries and um, vaccine safety. Um, when Sandy Hook happened on December 14th of that year, 
Um, well, it, sh it shook all of us, obviously. It shook the country. And um, we were approached by the city of Seattle Council um, for really a very important conversation on what to do with um, gun violence prevention. What is our obligation as public health professionals, as scientists, as practitioners, as advocates? What should we do? What could we do? This was 2012, 2013. This was a very different time than now. The funding landscape for gun violence research has drastically changed compared to 10 years ago, as many of you are aware. Um, 10 years ago, it was still the continuation of the drought, if you will. After um, the golden decade of gun violence research, as I think about it back in 1990s, where lots of great evidence um, was produced by several different studies, essentially many of them were funded by NCIPC, National Center for Injury Control and Prevention at CDC. After the Dickey Amendment, um, essentially research funding for this area um, came to a halt. Now, in terms of research, actually getting research done, there were few scientists and researchers in this country that bravely and courageously continued to do research. But funding was, was really hard to come by. A couple of foundations did that. NIJ continued to fund firearms research, but very much from the criminologic perspective. Um, much less so in terms of funding from health sciences authorities or agencies, CDC and NIH. That has changed drastically now. In the past two or three years, there is funding for firearm violence research. Back then, there wasn't. And the city of Seattle approached us, the council, and um, they voiced their support for doing research on this area. And they mentioned that it doesn't have to be necessarily related to Sandy Hook, it was just that when Sandy Hook happened, it had a profound impact on how this country and all of us think about firearm violence. And so with $153,000 um, from the city of Seattle, the council, we embarked on um, a study that was the first study, statewide study of um, firearm related harm after somebody has been shot. We thought that this would be important to, to conduct, to really better understand who are individuals who might be at high risk, who might be involved in a cycle of violence, both as a perpetrator and as a victim, as you know, as we say in the field, hurt people, hurt people, and better understand what we can actually do about it. So we conducted a cohort study by probabilistically and deterministically link the hospital record for all those people who had been hospitalized with a gunshot wound in the state of Washington, anywhere in the state of Washington, back in 2006 and 2007, with their prior records of hospitalization and arrest and conviction, and with their subsequent records of hospitalization and arrest and conviction and death, to get a better sense of the burden of um, harm associated with getting shot. And so I don't plan to go through the details of this study. My talk is about ERPO. Um, what we found in this study was that these individuals who had been shot, they were 21 times more likely to get shot and come back to the hospital again compared to your average patient in the hospital. They were four times more likely to get murdered. They were three times more likely to be arrested for firearm-related crime. And so this led to our realization and understanding of a relatively small group of people who are at the center of this harm, both in terms of perpetration and victimization, and really requires efforts both at the community level and policy level to reduce the risk among these individuals. So now today, my talk is very much policy-based. There is a whole level of efforts on community-based violence intervention that also have received tremendous support in the past couple of years from the current administration, historic unprecedented level of support for CVIs, community violence intervention, and extremely important work in terms of hospital-based violence intervention programs, community-based violence intervention programs that's being done, which really requires its own um, lecture series. But today I'm going to I'm going to focus on policy. And the policy I have chosen is the red flag laws or extremist protection order laws. 
And I know that some of you in the audience probably are deeply, deeply familiar with this, and some of you may not know much about it. So what I plan to do is to just cover the basics and then hopefully we can build on that and make it um, and elaborate on it. So Connecticut obviously is, as, as was mentioned, is was the first state that passed um, the risk-based firearm seizure law That's, that was in 1999 in, in reaction to, as Kerry mentioned, 1998 shooting at the lottery headquarter. Um, and Indiana, again, as a response to another shooting back in 2005, became the second state to do so. Um, in 2013, the Consortium for Risk-Based Firearm Policy recommended that states pass ERPA laws. The, this consortium is a, a group of colleagues, thought leaders, academics who work on gun violence prevention, um, highly respected group, several of our colleagues, um, and they have really been instrumental in terms of um, guiding policy as it relates to ERPOs, which are essentially modeled after domestic violence protection orders. So in terms of form and shape, they are modeled after domestic violence protection orders, but of course there are important differences in contra contrasts between ERPO and DVPO, which I'm happy to go through maybe during Q&A or um, provide resources to look at those specific contrasts between these two types of protection orders because it's important. And then as of now, um, we have 19 states in Washington DC that have these laws. And uh, several other states are thinking about it. This is something that the debate continues about it. And it's a very, very um, timely, um, as Kerry mentioned, very, very timely conversation on risk-based policies. Now, they have different names in different states. For example, in California, it's called Gun Violence Restraining Order, GVRO. In Connecticut, in Indiana, it's essentially called this risk warrant or risk-based firearm seizure laws. It has different names. But collectively, they are all um, based on risk. So they are risk-based policies for removal um, and disposition of individuals from firearms. So I will refer to them collectively as ERPOs. Now, what is the rationale for ERPO? What is the philosophical underpinning of an ERPO? Well, the point here is that if you look at the categories, the nine or so categories, the buckets of individuals who are prohibited from possessing or purchasing a firearm by federal law. If you look at that list, which I, I think many of you have, you will realize that it's a it's an over-inclusive and also under-inclusive list at the same time. It lists individuals that we really don't think actually they might be at high at the risk of perpetration. Um, but also it doesn't in include individuals who we think might be actually at risk of displaying dangerous behavior. So in the absence of such a list that really conforms to actually what we see in reality in terms of risk, we see that there are individuals who are at high risk of harming themselves or other people, but they're not prohibited from possessing or purchasing a firearm. So what to do about that? And that's the rationale for ERPO's birth in that it is designed to reduce the lethality of dangerous behavior. It is a behaviorally centered law tool. It's not based on mental health to stigmatize it. It's not based on a medical condition. It's based on behavior. If somebody is displaying dangerous behavior, especially during times of crisis, it could be suicidal crisis, it could be homicidal crisis, AirPods are, are, are they play a critical role in that time of crisis to reduce the likelihood of death, the likelihood of serious injury by removing firearm from the scene, by creating time and space between a firearm and that person who is at the risk of harming themselves or other people. They are not punitive. They are civil court orders with due processes protections. So they don't result in a criminal record for the respondent and um, and that's important by design, so it doesn't get into the criminal legal system in terms of the criminal route, but the civil route. In terms of who can petition for this, it's really an interesting conversation. It's changing. The landscape of it is changing. In all states, law enforcement can in initiate AirPods, including in Connecticut. Um, most states allow family members, household members, and intimate partners to do so. And that's an important part because it 
requires us to think about how we can empower communities, empower people, civilians, to actually do this. And I will talk to you about a couple of studies that we have done on this, because they can. The reality is that empiric evidence show, so far, based on the research that we have done, shows that overwhelming majority of petitioners are law enforcement. And so the question would be how we can do this in a way that promote awareness on these laws so people who live with somebody who might be dangerous, people who have a, let's say, suicidal teen at home, they have an, um, a household family member who might be going through a rough time, they feel empowered to actually petition for these firearms to be removed temporarily. In a few states, um, different combination of healthcare professionals, school administrators, employers, and co-workers can petition for ERPOs. This varies from state to state. For example, in DC, Maryland, Hawaii, and I think now in Connecticut in 2022 and with the expansion, healthcare professionals actually can uh, petition for ERPOs. The majority of states don't allow healthcare professionals to uh, petition for the ERPO directly. However, they can counsel their patients, obviously, and family members, so they petition for the for ERPOs. Typically, is a two-stage process, so like, Domestic violence protection orders, typically it's like that. You have an ex parte hearing where the presence of the respondent, the person who um, is displaying behavior, is not, is not necessary. It's done uh, relatively quickly um, and results in the removal of a firearm after the judge signs it. Then, typically, after two weeks or three weeks, there is a full hearing. And in that hearing, the judge decides whether they're going to extend um, ERPO for typically another one year. It's typically one year. Um, or not, they're going to abandon it and dismiss it. Um, and in that meeting, the respondent is also present uh, to provide their side of the argument. And uh, we have found in several states that we have done ERPO studies that the majority of these um, who that get to the ex parte, they do get um, extended for at least one year. And so they are granted essentially by the judge, many of them. So in terms of effectiveness, which I think is a question probably that many of you have in mind, um, it's, um, it's probably still kind of too early to say definitively um, their impact. There are a couple of studies that have been done by a good colleague, uh, Dr. Jeff Swanson of Duke, that some of you may have read um, the one in Connecticut, perhaps, is the most famous um, piece of scholarship in this area, but also Jeff has done studies in Indiana. Um, and typically, based on counterfactual analyses that have been done, which I'm not going to go through details of that today, but I'm happy to explain if you're interested, they have found that for every about 10 to 20 um, orders of ERPOs, um, one suicide was averted. This was not done via a case control study or a cohort study or comparing ERPO respondents versus a, an external group of individuals. That kind of methodology is very hard to do for ERPO methodologically because it's very hard to come up with a very solid comparison group. Now, there are efforts ongoing with some methodologic innovation that people in the field are trying to do. But it's a question that is difficult methodologically to answer because it's hard to find a comparator group that would mimic exactly what the ERPO respondents are, but it's just they didn't receive ERPO. So, and of course, you can't do a randomized trial of this. So, um, with some methodologic innovation, this has been shown that at least for suicide, we have some promising results. For mass shootings, there are a couple of papers now, including one that from our group and a multi-state collaboration that I will talk about came out just two weeks ago. Um, there is some evidence that ERPOs are being utilized in the cases of mass shootings. Again, these are not effectiveness studies, but they provide evidence that they are being utilized in the cases of mass shooting threats. And then uh, we don't really have much evidence as it relates to the effectiveness of ERPOs for interpersonal violence. So the field is wide open for the effectiveness assessment of ERPOs and interpersonal violence and assault beyond mass shootings. So what I would like to do maybe in the next 20 minutes or 30 minutes or so, I would like to talk to you about some of the examples of our research group's work um, on 
context uptake processes and implementation and assessment of the general knowledge of people about their posts. There is, if you do a PubMed search or search in different types of um, search engines, doesn't need to be health sciences. Um, you will see that we don't have many papers on ERPOS. These are relatively new laws, as I mentioned, except Connecticut and Indiana that have the older laws. The majority of other states have enacted these policies just in the past four or five years. And so uh, the future is going to be critical for ERPO research. This was the first study, statewide study of um, ERPOS that was published in Annals of Internal Medicine in, in, in Washington. Um, there's lots of information on this. I don't want to overwhelm you with this. Please feel free to take a look at the paper if you're interested. I just wanted to highlight a couple of them because my goal for this talk today is not to go in depth, but rather more breadth of the type of work that can be done for our post. Um, but a couple of interesting highlights of this paper. We found about 240 cases of ERPO for the first two and a half years of um, this loss. So it went into effect in Washington on December 8th. 2016. And so we closed the data set for this analysis by on May 10th, 2019. So the first two and a half years of ERPO law in Washington led to about 240 cases of ERPO. So roughly math, if you do the math, roughly 100 every year. But the interesting thing, as you see on the map of Washington state, is that you see a lot of blank, a lot of zeros in terms of counties in Washington that never did, never filed even one ERPO. Some of them have lower population, but it's not the case for all of them. Some of them actually have higher risk of suicide than other counties. The uptake of ERPO varies tremendously across different counties, across different jurisdictions, across different settings, even within the same state. This has been shown in California. This has been shown in Colorado. And this has been shown in some other states. And this is important because it shows a potential underutilization of this. And the questions about the why of this are re is really important, requires qualitative work, um, an in-depth conversation with police, with law enforcement, with community advocates and other people, the reasons that these are not being implemented um, the way they should. On the right-hand side, you see the number of firearms removed um, and the frequency of that. The majority of them, you can see maybe one or two, and also you have zero. The zero is those cases where the person didn't have a firearm, but still an ERPO was filed because there was concern about risk. You can file an ERPO for somebody who doesn't have firearms, but you're displaying dangerous behavior to prohibit them from purchasing. But you also see examples of number of firearms removed, like 35, 19, 16, 14. And the importance of that is, are we sure that we have removed all of their firearms? And I don't think the answer to that is yes. I, I'm not, I, I don't think we are certain that we have removed all the firearms. The person may still have a firearm someplace. And so, it's really important when we think about implementation of this and the forms that are populated and um, in terms of surrender and all, all, all other factors of this, to really think about enforcement in such a way that truly, um, and fidelity of it, truly conforms to what the law was designed to do. And it's easier said than done, um, but there are certain counties in the country that are doing a better job in terms of enforcing these. In terms of the history of dangerous behavior, the graph on the lower side of this and the bottom side of this slide shows you a pictorial representation of those. About 24% of these respondents had a history of um, domestic violence. About 62% had history of suicidal ideation. 37% had criminal justice system, criminal legal system encounter, and 47% had substance use history. So it shows that AirPods are doing what they're supposed to do, which is finding essentially mainly those individuals who have shown the history of dangerous behavior. Then what we did was to read all of the court records for all of these 240 cases, all of the records, all the affidavit, all the petitions for everything that was in the record. Some of them you know, have 100 or 50 pages, some of them have 900 pages. 
to really understand from the prevention perspective, to really understand what are some of those social determinants of health that may have to do with where this person is in terms of the production of that dangerous behavior, if you will. And we thought it would be great to maybe model this with the different layers of the onion of social ecologic model, because it's, an, it's, a, it's a model that is well known um, to many people in the field. And the factors that led into this dangerous behavior were fascinating to read. They're really at very different levels, at the individual level, relationship level, systems level, structural level, societal level. And this is important because it really highlights the fact that while AirPods are really important and valuable when we are at the time of crisis, it's important to also sometimes go further upstream and think about factors that have led to this crisis and see if we can do something further upstream so we actually don't get to this point um, and have maybe more profound impact on prevention and saving lives. So these individuals who we studied as respondent, they really showed a variety of different types of um, characteristics and profiles in terms of their um, history of dangerous behavior, but also medical conditions, mental health, substance use, and, and other, other factors. One of the things that was interesting to us was that some of the cases had a history of or, or, or were, were struggling with dementia and cognitive decline. Again, as I mentioned, nothing like mental health or medical condition should be the basis for ERPO. The basis for ERPO should be dangerous behavior. However, it's important to think about what are the underlying conditions that led to that dangerous behavior. Why is this person behaving dangerously? What's the reason for it? and try to address that to the extent possible. And this will come up in the next couple of slides. I will talk about uh, social services for people who are respondents to ERPO. But this is a paper that we focused on people with um, dementia. And we found that for many of these people, it was really the intersection of dementia, cognitive decline, depression, alcohol use, suicidal thoughts. And several of these people had access to a firearm that was unloaded, that was loaded and unlocked. And sometimes their partners or other people were not aware, or somebody in the household, they found about it, and they started, um, they started petitioning in ERPO. Um, and so this highlights an opportunity for people who see patients um, to really talk to them about this, to family members, to really um, start a conversation on prevention. Um, one of the interesting things about this, and I will talk about this later, is that Removal, removing a firearm from home for somebody who might be at risk takes different forms or shapes. It doesn't need to be ERPO. But if those other forms of attempts to try to remove firearm, they don't work, ERPO remains a possibility for family members to petition the court or contact law enforcement um, to petition the court on their behalf and remove firearms. The challenge with that is when those family members want to do so, um, they face some barriers. So this was a paper where we did qualitative interviews with that minority group of petitioners, which is civilian petitioners. This it was the first study of civilian petitioners um, that we are aware um, in the literature, where we talked to 15 individuals who had petitioned ERPOs for ERPOs um, themselves without relying on, the, on, the law, on law enforcement and the police. And it was really fascinating to hear their stories and um, the challenges, the barriers, and also facilitators of this process for them. Um, in terms of barriers, there was a perceived lack of help connecting with services. This is what I just talked about in the prior slide. As you know, there are underlying conditions that lead to that dangerous behavior. It could be mental health, it could be substance use, it could be cognitive decline, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that family expect or they actually hope for is once the ERPO process is complete, meaning the firearms have been removed, now are there opportunities to actually connect their loved one to social services? So the study in Connecticut that I mentioned to you with Jeff Swanson, one of the beauties of that study is in, a, study, in addition to showing the impact on 
potentially averting suicide was that it showed in Connecticut how many people actually were able to receive services for mental health, for substance use, after um, they have become a respondent for ERPO. So this is where the value of ERPO could be augmented in the future for different states. If there is that link to social services, that could be potentially very powerful. Right now, that doesn't exist by design. It's not required necessarily for that connection to happen in many states, but it's an opportunity for states to think about that. The other challenge that families faced was the administrative and judicial processes, the ambiguity around that. Some of them were told that they can't petition for ERPOs. That's not true. Some of them uh, found that law enforcement actually was not very familiar with this or was not well trained to do so. They also heard sometimes paradoxical things from the judges. Um, and so they had some um, concern about the final messaging. And the implications of this, once the ERPO is filed, where does the record go? Um, there was this um, petitioner who said that as they were coming back to the United States from Canada, and they were crossing the border, um, when they ran the ID for their partner, they, they, they found out about ERPO in their record, and they had a conversation about it. So uh, some family members have questions about where do these go and what are the implications of them? And then they are in distress, many of them. It's a moment of crisis. And so they are in distress. Sometimes they don't want to be in a position, in an adversarial position for their loved ones. And so it's a time of stress. And um, it's really, really important for social support services and systems to work together to make this as less tedious as possible for people who choose to petition themselves directly without relying on the system. Or law enforcement. On the other hand, there was some great news as well. There were some uh, individuals who actually had some previous legal experience themselves, paralegal and others, and so they obviously knew the system better. They had less difficulty petitioning for ERPOs. Um, they loved it when there were some advocates um, for them to help them with the process. Some of them mentioned that actually the court clerks, they were wonderful. They helped them with paperwork. They helped them with all the questions. And so they loved it because that helped them, you know, uh, make the process more st streamlined. But many of them asked for simplification of the ERPO process, and they felt that if the process becomes a little bit less complex, more simple, we probably can expect more people, civilians, to actually um, do it on their own. So something for future implementation research to, to tackle. As I mentioned to you, um, I think the situation has now changed in Connecticut, but the majority of states don't allow health professionals to, to petition the court directly. They can, however, counsel patients. They can con contact law enforcement, or um, they can you know, file it independently in, as I said, three or four states. We did a study that just came out a few months ago um, in Washington asked all providers, physicians, and um, nurse practitioners about ERPOs and their knowledge of ERPOs. And uh, about three quarters of them had no idea about ERPOs. So that's right off the bat an, idea, an opportunity to really promote awareness about them. About 75, 76% of physicians and nurse practitioners in Washington, they, they were not familiar with ERPO at all. So that's a striking number. I don't know what that number would look like in Connecticut. Um, but we gave them scenarios and asked them, so if you were going to actually going to engage with the ERPO process, how would that look like? What would you do? And um, would you be willing to engage in the process? Overwhelmingly said yes. As you can see the on the graph on the left-hand side, you can see that the two colors, the green color and brown color, the majority were on the in the green zone in the right hand side. The majority said yes, they're willing to do it. Some of them were more willing to do it. Some of them were somewhat willing to do it. But you can see that the most of them were willing to do it in terms of counseling the patients, less so working with police, and even less so filing it independently themselves for a variety of reasons. They're busy. They you know may require a liaison or advocate or navigator for ERPO to help them. 
Um, but you can see overall it's a positive picture. They're willing to engage in the process. On the right-hand side, you see the results when we ask them to rank exactly between these three options, which one they like the best. And you can see for the majority of them, the first option is for them to counsel patients, much less so the first option being taught working with the police and work, um, even less so filing independently themselves. So something to have in mind as it relates to working with healthcare professionals to file airport directly or work with individuals or entities who can actually file directly. So those were just some, some examples of some of the papers we have published in the past couple of years. There is more, I'm happy to talk to you, but um, I thought maybe we'll just stop there in terms of what the research has done and just spend maybe the next 10 minutes or so before I take questions on um, what I think is next in this, in this area. So the first, as I mentioned, is knowledge, training, promoting awareness about this. This was a study that we conducted that came out last year in JAMA Network Open where we um, collaborated with um, my good colleague, Dr. Matt Miller, Dr. Deb Israel, based on National Firearms Survey that I know Matt has spoken about in this lecture series. Um, and we looked at the knowledge of gun laws among people who are gun owners and among people who are not gun owners, but they live in a gun owning home. And we asked three or four different, we focused on this analysis for this paper, we focused on the laws that we felt gun owners or their family members' knowledge of the law would be consequential, would be important. Because as you know, there are certain gun laws that individuals, civilians don't have control over. It's really the job of the law enforcement or others to do it. But for some laws, when you think about causal pathway or you're doing a quasi-experimental research, one of the mediators of that might be the knowledge of gun owners or the knowledge of people who live in a gun owning home. A prime example of that is CAP law, Child Access Prevention Law. How are, how are CAP laws supposed to work? Well, presumably, the mediators of how CAP laws should work is knowledge of the law and the liability, civil and criminal liability, that may ensue if you don't lock up your guns when there's a kid around. And so that knowledge is really important. The same for ERPOs in that if you are a family member and you would like to petition, it's important to know that your state actually has an ERPO law. And so if you look at the bottom of this table, on the left-hand side, on the left column, you see the actual status of the law. So we are saying in states that actually have an ERPO law, about 40% of gun owners said, yes, I know our state has an ERPO law. 4% said, actually, no, their state doesn't have an ERPO law. But 55%, they didn't know. They were unsure if their state has an ERPO law. This is in states that have ERPO law, more than half, they were unsure. And the number is even more striking among family members. About three quarter of people who lived in a gun owning home, living in a state that has an ERPO law, like Connecticut, they had no idea that their state has an ERPO law. And so again, this is an opportunity for promotion, for promoting awareness about these laws, because it actually may have a bearing on the causal pathway in terms of the effectiveness of the law. There are also opportunities in terms of design and implementation. The person who did this shooting in Indiana last year, um, they killed eight people in the FedEx facility. His mom has said multiple times that I'm worried about my son. He's displaying lots of dangerous behavior. They had removed, the police, law enforcement had come and they had seized, they had removed the firearms because this was all over the news, New York Times, Washington Post, others. What happened to Indiana's red flag law? How did it not work? They have one of the oldest laws in the country after Connecticut. Why it didn't work? And this has, you know, this is at the heart of implementation, design and implementation of the law. They removed the firearms. They, they, they listened to the mom. They, they, fired, they removed the firearms. The problem was that they never, they never filed an ERPO. They didn't file an ERPO. 
they just remove the firearms without actually filing for an ERPO, for risk-based um, warrant there. And the ramification of that is profound. Why? Because then the information doesn't end up in the next system, in the background check system, and the person can go get guns again. So that's a really powerful example of why showing fidelity and implementation to the law is important because when you do, when you file an ERPO and if it's granted, supposedly, it should go to the next system, to the background system. So the person not only are dispossessed of their firearm, but also they cannot purchase a firearm for the duration of the protection order. This was not the case in Indiana. So the design of the law and the implementation of it is critically important for it to save lives. Because of that issue, as I mentioned, there is continuous debate and conversations about the content of the law, the design of the law, especially as it relates to mass shootings. Every time when there is a mass shooting, every time there is a public shooting, I receive lots of emails. I'm sure many colleagues here do the same. Many colleagues around the country do the same. Always receive questions about red flag laws. Every time there is a shooting, every single time, and the question is the should have, the, the ifs, what ifs, should have and would have. Would this have been prevented if people were paying attention? Would, say, would lives have been saved if we had paid attention, if we had implemented, if we had filed all the time? And so in some scenarios, the answer is yes, this could have easily been prevented by uh, more agility, more awareness, and sometimes it's more complicated. This study that was led by my good colleague, April, Dr. April Zioli, just came out, I think, last week or 10 days ago, um, is, a, is the first paper from a multi-state collaboration that we have in the six states that you see on this slide right now as part of a study that has been funded by National Collaborative and Gun Violence Research to really look at the uptake of ERPOs, the characteristics of the ERPOs, the respondents, the petitioners, and also try to look at the effectiveness of ERPOs, at least uh, for now we're doing some ecologic analysis on, at the county level, and the results haven't been um, finalized yet, but hopefully in the next few months. Um, but this, this study came out just a couple of weeks ago on the, this description of these threats of multiple victim mass shootings. And you can see the numbers in each state and et cetera. Um, and the, the characteristics, the typologies of different types of threats. So for example, maximum casualty threat, the respondent displays a clear desire to shoot and kill as many people as possible, such as when a location or school is the target. This would be like um, Parkland, for example, right? The person posted that YouTube videos that I'm going to kill 20 people, at least 20 people. That's what he did. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting because when you look at these records, you see that about 10%, one in 10 of all AirPods that have been filed in these, um, in these states, they are about threats of mass shootings. And the most common is against uh, our schools. Um, of course, you know, as a parent of two young children, four and ten, this, this always um, is something that's in our minds as parents whenever we drop off our kids. Um, there was just a shooting yesterday in Seattle um, in high school. Um, and so you, you think about the potential utility of these laws in terms of saving lives, preventing that one incident that may kill so many people may destroy families. And um, the good news here, at least, is that it seems to be used, at least to some extent, in cases of threat of a mass shooting. And um, I think it's conceivable, it's very reasonable to think that some of them did actually prevent mass shootings from happening. Um, you can't prove it, but it, I think it's reasonable to assume that some of them at least saved lives. And I think that's good news. What about resources? If states want to do this, do they have the money to do it? And this is exactly what I think the points that Kerry mentioned at the, uh, the top of the hour, they were just so, um, so on point. Um, with, the, with, with the final Bipartisan Safer Community, Community, Communities Act um, 
law that went into effect recently with with that as many people call it as you know the first um gun violence prevention law at the federal level at this comprehensive level after so many years after ever um there is a lot of enthusiasm about this particular act it has different components you don't have time to go through all different components of it but let me just focus on ERPO here. Exactly as Carrie mentioned, $750 million in terms of funding that will be available to states. It's called, um, the terminology of it they have chosen in the bill to call it crisis intervention, like a broader term. But really it does include ERPOs, as you see here, red flag laws, to really help states implement this. Because states do need support at the federal level to be able to actually implement this. Just two days ago, just two days ago, I received this in my email inbox that um, the Office of Fire and Safety and Violence Prevention in the state of Washington, which is housed in the Department of Commerce, they actually are seeking, this is an RFP, they're actually seeking consultant for um, help to improve access to material to support the implementation of Washington's state risk protection laws, which is our ERPA laws. I suppose this is happening in other states as well that they are receiving federal funds to be able to provide funding for the implementation of this. Department of Justice, actually, as you see on the top of this slide, has you know, a model statutes that really provide information and says this is the way it needs to be done. So let me just end my, um, my presentation with this slide that says essentially what I have said, that there are lots of opportunities here to work in area, in area of ERPOs. Um, this is not the only, it's not panacea, it's not the only approach, there are other approaches, there are voluntary approaches. This is slide I'm showing you based on an NIH-funded study that we have with Dr. Amy Bits in Colorado that shows essentially voluntary places that you could go voluntarily and um, store your firearms. ERPO is one, one approach. It doesn't need to be ERPO. It could be voluntary do not sell lists. There are policies in some states that have, uh, allow you to add your name to the do not sell list. Um, and then, as I said, there are storage places for this to, to go there. Um, when Sandy Hook happened on that morning, I think the shooting began at 9.30. This was the question that immediately came up in some of the websites. Um, the mother of the shooter was a legal gun owner. She had lots of different guns. There was not, and she was not the person who was displaying dangerous behavior. Now, some states, Washington was the first one, I think, have allowed for ERPOs to be filed when the respondent is a minor, um, for example, and they are displaying um, dangerous behavior, so the firearms are removed from the household. But these questions will remain for many of us in many years to come and hopefully provide some thoughts about how to move forward and save lives in the future. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so uh, Dr. Rohani is going to um, moderate questions. So you should be able to unmute yourself and, and ask them. Um, so I will just open it up to that. So perhaps while people are thinking, I will um, will start with a question. Um, as you were talking about the facilitators and barriers um, of people being able to uh, to get an ERPO, I'm wondering how sort of the size of the county or the size of the the place matters um, to people being able to access um, resources. I I can see small counties having facilitators and barriers, and I can see large counties having facilitators and barriers. So I was just wondering if that's something that you would come into, um, come across in your research. That's a great question, Carrie. No, we haven't looked at specifically the features of the county in terms of, for example, population and size. And it, it, it's an equity question that you raise, which is an important question in terms of people's um, access to resources. The majority of people we talk to, as you could probably imagine, were in King County. Mm -hmm. um, and so, which is, you know, the 12th, the 13th most populous county in, in the country. And with the resources that are plenty and much more than, let's say, a small county. Um, but I think um, the, 
my my sense is that the cooperation of people in the court and also the willingness of law enforcement and community advocates to support it is number one critical factor in terms of whether this proceeds in terms of filing of it in a county, probably more so than the size of the county or the population of the county. Um, having said that, I, I'm not aware of any research that actually has tried to look at the really interesting question that you, you raised. Um, definitely something to, to look at in the future. Thank you. So, um, hi, how's it going? Uh, my name's Chris. Thank you. This is really, really interesting. So, um, I'm curious about a couple of questions regarding maybe more like, I don't know if it's specific to designs, but, or just, um, thoughts. One of them is looking at, um, Erpo's comparing illegal gun owners to legal gun owners and see if there is anything relative to that, like, or if there are tools or things like that, that exist for, you know, someone who knows their family member has a gun, but they may not be able to, you know, that the government doesn't know they have the gun. So can you file an ERPO for someone who um, doesn't legally own that gun? That's a great question, Chris. So not an ERPO just because they are an illegal gun owner. No, because ERPO is based on, you know, displaying of a dangerous behavior. But you bring up a really good point, which is sometimes, you know, families, they have distrust of the system or they don't want their loved one to be in trouble. And so the person who um, is illegally an owner of a gun, of course, there should be other mechanism and there are other mechanisms to remove their firearms because let's say they have a conviction of a felony and they have not uh, sought the restoration of their firearms rights because even with felony, for certain felony, you can actually request for your firearms rights to be restored, you can, uh, after certain years. For some type of felony, you can't. But um, that's different from ERPO, right? Where you need to actually show and display of dangerous behavior. If there is, yes, if there is clear evidence for that and it's convincing, somebody can um, petition for an ERPO. Now, the really interesting thing that also your question reminds me of is that these are non punitive. As I mentioned, they are supposed to be therapeutic or preventive. Um, but sometimes arrest does happen within the context of ERPO. Not much, not a lot, but it does happen. In some cases, it leads to an arrest for a variety of reasons, for a variety of um, circumstances. And one of them is a situation where you know somebody might um, have broken the law. Um, and so that in terms of the interaction, especially of the law enforcement with individuals whose gun needs to be removed is something that the field is really looking at in terms of the equitable way of doing so and its impact on communities. Thank you. Yeah, that, I should probably clarify that I work for an organization in Hartford and most of the youth that we work with own guns illegally um, for defensive purposes, but sometimes they get into it and um, there may be people in their lives that know that they have a gun and would use it, but it would be great if there was a tool that was outside that was meant to be um, non punitive that would just get that the gun away from them, then then that guns off the street, then they don't have it. And that would be a useful tool and a useful way to study even just as a comparison group um, for other herbos. But uh, yeah. my other question, what is that? Sorry. Oh, no, absolutely. And I think just one um, point is that some of the voluntary options for you know storing firearms away from the home might be scenarios where that might be something that could be potentially thought about because sometimes for those you now of course there's a whole we had another webinar last month I'm, I'm happy to share with you the whole idea of liability for individuals who store somebody's firearm um but it, again i think it emphasizes this spectrum of options that might be available some of them may work better for certain situations but absolutely i think you raise a very important question about youth and firearm ownership and issues of self-defense especially in certain communities that are high risk yes you had a second question you think yeah so it's uh, kind of unrelated but it's to what carrie was saying about um looking at different sized counties is there has anybody looked at or are you aware of research looking at, for example, Connecticut 
the county is in a seat of government and is in a seat of law enforcement. So, um, so every you know we have uh, individual municipalities, and is there any difference in the way that um, ERPOs are issued in a state like Connecticut, where we only have eight counties, but because they're not government, they're non-governmental, um, then that means we have 169 municipalities and 130 something police forces, and um, plus the state police and everything. So it ends up is does it get applied very differently than it does in a state that has you know, uh, counties, government. I think it does. That's a really good point. We haven't looked at it necessarily. What we have looked at is the uptake of herpos in different counties in Washington. It's correlation, Chris, with the actual rates of homicide or suicide. And we have actually found a very weak correlation. So it's not as if, you know, those counties that have higher rates of actual violence um, necessarily, you know, file more herpos. That's what we have done not in terms of the nature of the county, in terms of you know the federal government or in terms of the state government or municipalities. Um, but there is a study out of California that they have done. I'll look it up and send it to you, or you can look it up, that they have looked at certain characteristics of different counties. Um, but I don't think any, any research so far has answered that specific question that you raised in terms of the resources, in terms of the size, and in terms of just the, you know, the presence of different um, governmental level at that state level and municipalities. That's a really interesting point. Um, yeah, definitely something for future to look at. Thank you. Of course. Um, I just to let you know, I've put a few resources in the chat. Um, one is the Swanson paper. Uh, that was mentioned. One was a commentary that Dr. Swanson wrote to update that original paper. Um, and the other is from the judicial branch, how to get an ERPO in the state of Connecticut. Um, so we are we are at time. We are at 1.30. Um, and so I want to just say thank you so much. Um, this has been uh, super interesting and so informative and just lots of things to think about. So thank you so much, Dr. Rahani. And it's great to meet you. I've um, I've heard a lot about you, and but this is, I think, our first time sort of meeting, and I look forward to formally meeting you in, in D.C. later this month. Um, this presentation, we will email it out to everyone. Um, and so uh, please know that that's coming and uh, feel free to follow arms on Twitter for more um, of our upcoming events and, and future web webinars. So, um, Dr. Rohani, I'm going to give you the opportunity to say the last word and then um, and then I think I think we can we will be just thinking about this for the rest of the day. Sure. No, it's wonderful to be back well, virtually um, in Connecticut and meet um, several of you and um, thank you for the opportunity. I loved it, and I hope that we'll stay in touch. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.